Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a real privilege to be on this stage. Um, very nice to be here. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that this presentation does contain some images which some people might find distressing. There's a lot of imagery of fire. Um, so please, I just advise viewer discretion as we go forward. OK, so forensic architecture. So we are a research agency based in Goldsmiths University in London. And we are a multidisciplinary group. We're comprised of architects, investigative journalists, um, developers, lawyers, filmmakers. We're a very varied bunch. And we carry out investigations into human rights violations, and we advocate for people who've been affected by them. So we, we, con we construct uh, 3D reconstructions of crime scenes, and we deal with state violence, and in this particular case, police violence. This is an image from our investigation into the killing of Mark Duggan by the Metropolitan Police in 2011. And we also work with experts in fields such as computational fluid dynamics in order to understand these complex phenomena in time and space. So what you can see here is the cloud is a representation. It's an isosurface of the um, gunshot residue, the detectab detectability of which would have been um, detectable by smell in this internet cafe. And this is an image from our um, investigation into the killing of Halit Yozgat. And we also um, document violence in time and space, and we make web platforms. So this is uh, a clip from our video, an investigation into the NSO group. And they produce a piece of spyware called Pegasus. And the, the markers that you can see on the timeline there are moments of infection for this, um, this, this piece of malware. And we also stand with civil society groups. Um, and we um, advocate for people who have been affected by violence. So um, this is us presenting our findings into that investigation into the killing of Mark Duggan to an audience in Tottenham Town Hall in 2019. And we're standing there with the rights activist uh, Stafford Scott on the mic there. And we also display our work in cultural forums, such as um, museums and galleries. This is an image from a recent exhibition called Cloud Studies. And this is really important for us, because this is when the work comes out into the real world, and it becomes a kind of polit a political discussion and a conversation that, that shapes the world around us. So on the 4th of August 2020, a massive explosion ripped through the city of Beirut. Um, the blast killed 200 people, 6,500 people were injured, and large areas of the city were destroyed. And we were asked by the, rights, the organization uh, Madamas to look at the open source material that was available for this case and try to put together that material and reconstruct an idea of how this explosion, uh, like the things that led up to it and the reasons why it took place. And so at Forensic Architecture, we have this concept of an open source investigation. And these are all clips um, that are taken from the moment of the blast and prior to the blast. And the idea is that using this raw material, this data, theoretically, anyone could reconstruct the investigation. So this is, this is kind of one of the ideas with, behind um, open source investigation and the investiga investigative commons. So we gathered lots of these videos. And when we gather footage of forensic architecture, one of the first things that we do is we synchronize it in time. So these are images of the fire taking place in the warehouse before the explosion. And the moment of the blast provides um, an anchor point for these pieces of footage to be situated in time. And we also situate those pieces of footage in space. So here you can see we've got a very detailed model of the city of Beirut. And this is taken from OpenStreetMap data. Um, and so you, you can see that we've got all of the buildings in the city. And within this model, we situate the camera positions from those pieces of footage. So we, we take our cameras and we work out where they are in space. And so you can see here, if we have an image, um, we've got these architectural elements that are visible. And then they relate to objects on the ground. So we can locate these cameras. 
And we have this trick we can do. We can use a technique known as a dolly zoom, uh, a cinematic technique, which some of you may be aware of. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to change the focal length of a camera while simultaneously maintaining the composition of an image such that the image overlaps with the model. And you can see here on the right-hand side, the um, camera finds its place in the 3D model when the image overlaps with the geometry. So once we've situated these pieces of footage, we can start to look at more detail at the clouds that are unfolding in, in this fire prior to the explosion. So here we use a method called a slit scan, and we analyze the color of the pixels that are coming from that plume of smoke. And we can see that they go from a light gray color to a dark gray color over time. So something is happening here within the warehouse. Something is evolving over time. And then if we zoom into this area here, we can see that there's this small explosion that takes place. And there are these sparkles of light. And so speaking to experts on this subject, this is likely to be the explosion of fireworks that were stored within the warehouse. We can go even further than that. We can start to model and sculpt these clouds, these plumes that are coming from the, from the warehouse. So here, um, we're using the sculpting tools to push and pull the surface of the cloud. And you can see that using one image, we get an outline or a silhouette of the cloud. But what we do is we always try to have a polyperspectival view of the scene. So we take a, a, a counter shot, another angle, and we use that to sculpt from the, other, from the opposite angle. And then we get a three-dimensional shape, three-dimensional form for that cloud. And we can also sculpt and model the fireball that is at the center of this blast, this spherical object. And we know that this blast was expanding at an incredible rate, because we can see that on simultaneous frames that have been synchronized, the sphere is at a different scale. So you could say that the speed of the expansion is beyond the threshold of the resolution of the cameras that were capturing it. So this is an incredibly a dynamic object, incredibly rapid explosion. And so if we look at that sphere more closely and zoom in here, we can use the radius and the center of the sphere to calculate approximately where in the warehouse that blast or originated. And over here, we move to another camera in the city. And this shows us the blast with a wider sphere because it's expanded. And here we see another view from across the city. Again, moving out into the bay. And finally, here, far out to sea, this witness was able to capture the full evolution of the plume, the full evolution of the blast that emerged. And this was a very critical piece of footage because it's one of the few shots that showed us the full extent, and it allows us to measure the height of the cloud so we can see that it's 755 meters high. So at 554, we have a, a cloud coming out of the east side of the building. Uh, at 6 p.m., we have a second cloud, a dark plume, coming out from here, again on the east side. And then finally, at 6.07, just before the explosion, we have this other plume that has the flashes of light within it. So images of the contents of the warehouse were leaked. And what it was emerged is that this warehouse contained a very large amount of ammonium nitrate. And we know from these images that the um, ammonium nitrate was stored in a very haphazard way. The bags were broken. The site was contaminated. So you can see from these images. And so what we did is we situated these images within a 3D model of the warehouse as well. So you can see there at the top, the bay number is visible, number eight. So we know which position inside the warehouse this um, photo was taken. Um, and here we have a video that was captured from inside the warehouse as well, showing more bags of ammonium nitrate. And midway through this clip on the ceiling, we can see the numbers four and five. So we're able to situate this video as well, and a number of architectural objects within the space. So using that central location for the spherical blast, the fireball, and using the amount of ammonium nitrate that we know was being stored in the warehouse, we can approximate the distribution and the area that that ammonium nitrate would have taken up. 
We also know that there was ammonium phosphate stored in there. We also know that there was detonating cord and also car tires. And so what we're able to do is we're able to approximate the position of the fireworks, the flashes of light that we see in that cloud on the west, and also the very dark plume that we see on the east, the car tires. And so in conclusion, what we have with this setup is essentially a makeshift bomb. And you can see this quote here from Gareth Collett. Ammonium nitrate is extremely difficult to detonate by fire alone. However, when confined and contaminated, this can lead to catastrophic detonation. And so you can see here as well from the NASA damage map that the, uh, the damage extended to 1,570 meters. The regulations say that ammonium nitrate should not be kept within 1,570 meters of a residential area. So we find the state to be negligent in their upholding of the regulations for this hazardous material. Um, and in the spirit of open source as well, we publish our 3D models from our findings, from our investigations online. So you can go here to our GitHub page, and it links to a repository where we have the blend files for the warehouse and also the site model. So another project that we worked on. On the 14th of June, 2017, um, a devastating fire broke out in Grenfell Tower in West London. And this was a fire which killed 72 people. And it was the worst residential building fire um, in this country, in the UK, since World War II. And as Londoners, we woke up and we saw this. And this was a, this was a, 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 a devastating fire. And it was something that we couldn't ignore. And it was something that we immediately had to start figuring out what happened here, like what was going on, how was this fire developing. And so on the night of the fire, hundreds of Londoners took out their smartphones and they captured small clips, short clips, showing the fire. And none of these clips on their own tells you the whole picture of the fire, but together they build something bigger. So the idea is that with this project, what we can do is we can take those pieces of footage and then we can motion track them. And then if we can motion track those pieces of footage, we can then project them onto the surface of a 3D model of the building. And then the idea is that if we can project enough of those videos onto the surface of the building, we can start to understand how the fire spreads and how it develops on the night of the fire. But there's a bit of a problem, because this footage is not very suitable for tracking. So I mean, if you look at a tutorial, a guide, on how to motion track footage, you'll see lots of different pieces of advice, some of which is to ensure that the scene has got uh, consistent lighting to avoid sharp changes in exposure, not to move the camera too quickly so you don't get motion blur so that you can track features on the image, and also to move through the scene left and right, forwards and backwards, up and down, so you capture the parallax of the scene and you understand the three-dimensionality of the space. But this is not something that we have the luxury of having. These people that captured these images were scared, and they were being pushed around the site by police, uh, emergency services. And this is an object that's so dynamic and so bright, and it was captured at night that it doesn't lend itself to motion tracking. So we find ourselves using very uh, manual, very painstaking techniques in order to motion track these frames. So here you can see I'm using a 3D camera, and I'm manually adjusting it using the 3D cursor, using annotation tools to outline particular elements. So here I'm outlining a window and also um, outlining the area of the fire so I can get a camera match every 10 frames, every 50 frames, every 100 frames. So despite that, we still have managed to track many of the videos of the fire spreading at Grenfell Tower. So this is a compilation of um, uh, videos that we've tracked so far. And you can see how the fire spreads up the east facade of the building very rapidly. And I think it's, uh, it's one of these things where an individual image on its own doesn't tell the whole picture, but when they start to come together and they start to cooperate as videos, you get a sense of the uh, magnitude and the complexity of the violence that's taking place here in this building. And so we also have vast amounts of data relating to the building. And it's all buried inside of PDF documents 
Um, some of them are inside the Grenfell Tower inquiry documents. On the left here, you can see a document called External Spread of Fire, and these yellow areas indicate where the fire was at different points in the night. And on, on the right-hand side, you can see the work of Eric Guillaume and colleagues who captured other frames. And so part of what we do at Forensic Architecture is to take this information that's buried in documents all, all over the place in loads of different repositories and bring it together into 3D space and time so that it is understandable, so it is um, conceivable as an object. And so what we can do with these images from these documents is we can create basically a, a stop-motion animation. So the red indicates the area of the building that's burning, the black indicates an area that's burnt, and the yellow that you can see from the other document is just the area, the full area of the spread of fire. So we build this stop-motion animation, and this allows us to create a full mapping of the spread of the fire. So what you're looking at here is a UV map of the building, the four facades of the building unfolded. And this is another part that's very important to our work. When we have um, information such as that from the documents and we have photographic information, we're always trying to compare them and verify them and corroborate them to each other. So here we use the photographic imagery of the fire to corroborate those mappings. And then what we can do with that map, with that shape, is we can wrap it back around the building, and then we have a graphic representation of the spread of fire. So similar to the way that the images and the videos and the footage captured this spread, we could do the same with a graphic image. And because this is operating on a precise 3D model at a, at a fixed scale, a real scale, we can do things like calculate the total area of the fire, that's the total area of the surface of the building, that's burnt. And we also know the rate at which it's burning as well, so we can use these metrics. And we can also, it unlocks a whole load of other interesting facets and mappings about the spread of fire. So, for instance, on the night of the fire, many of the residents reported hearing these popping noises, almost like gunshots. And these were the sounds of the windows breaking. So what we can do is we can use that spread of fire shape, we can turn it into a geonodes object with thickness, and we can get it to intersect with the building's windows. And so we know when particular buildings, sorry, when particular windows are breaking at particular times, and then that data can be used and exported and taken to other parts of the project. We also know, based on that fire spread mapping, the likely amount of heat radiation that would have been experienced on the ground at certain points around the tower. So here you can see um, we have a plan view of the building, and the lighter color indicates greater levels of heat radiation. And that fire spread also gives us an idea of the smoke cloud that would have come from the tower, and also the particulate matter that was emitted from the building and then deposited over London. So you can see here the yellow indicates particulate matter quantity that was deposited on the ground around the tower. And so, as I mentioned before, we always try to work to advocate for people who've been affected by violence. Um, and this is a process, uh, this slide here, related to situated testimony. And we were lucky enough a few years ago to sit down with one of the residents. This is a guy called Nicholas Burton. He was on the 19th floor of Grenfell Tower. And we were able to sit with him with a 3D model, and he was able to tell us not only about the layout of his flat, the furniture, where everything was, but he was also able to tell us about his movements on the night of the fire. And in this clip that I want to show you, he explains the moment when he realizes he has to leave his flat. I don't think I saw a per I did see a person, I just saw a hand come and grab my wife, and then another hand on the right hand side come and say, let's go. And I said, look, I've got my dog here. And the father said, I'm sorry, let's go. And that was it, we just into the darkness. Sorry, are you with Hilly and Zoe? So, yeah, so there's two fire officers. I, I, never, I didn't see them, I don't know if it was a man or woman or anything, I don't know. And do you think Pilly was ahead of you? Yeah, Pilly came out first because yeah. I had her waist. Because when, when she didn't go, so let's to go. Hold her up. So then the guy came out and then I kind of grabbed Pilly's waist so we came through here, yeah. and then I lost Pilly in this area. I let go, or she, they moved her forward. I was, I was screaming, like, like, where's my wife? And then someone just said, look, we got her. And then, and then I didn't know where she was, because it's just, it's just black, I just can't see, can't even see any light. And then we went into the stairwell. I don't know whether he was on this, on that side, 
I don't know by what the time you're in, by the, by by the time, time you're in the stairs, stairwell, yeah. then we're then he's on my uh, left and I'm on the right. So there's two of us trying to to go down systematically, you know, down flat, down flat, down flat. So I'd like you to think of uh, forensic architecture as the intersection of the spatial and the political. And I think we're all here because we um, believe in 3D software being, being free, being available to civil society groups. And I think we have something of a spatial commons or a digital spatial commons when we work with the tools that we work with. So that's just something I want you to hold in your heads as you go forward into the conference. Um, and also, these are just two of the projects that we've worked on at Forensic Architecture. There's a vast array of projects that we've done in the past, in cover covering ecological violence. We use machine learning. Um, you know, we cover the use of tear gas in crowds. So I'd really encourage you to, um, you, on my speaker profile, you can go to uh, the Forensic Architecture website and have a look at the projects that we've worked on. Or, of course, feel free to reach out to me at some point during the conference. And thank you very much. For your time.